Uh, my name is Hugo. I'm one of the content chairs for the Expo Committee this year. Um, but enough about me. Uh, we're really excited to have uh, both of our guests here on stage with us right now. Um, we have current sitting SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce, uh, otherwise known as Crypto Mom. <laughs> and former CFTC uh, uh, chairman and current Sloan le uh, senior lecturer at Sloan, um, Gary Gensler. I think you're a really kind of crypto great grandfather. Is that right? <laughs> because the current CFTC chairman is Crypto Dad, so that would make you Crypto Great Grandfather. Yes. Uh, my uh, my uh, eldest daughter uh, got a puppy a couple of years ago, and I said, "That's not my son. That's my grandson." <laughs> so, so, so no, you're right, Hester. Hester and I first met when uh, I was working in the administration, and you were working for. Uh, a senator who I consider a friend, even though he was at times tough one day. But, uh, uh, As he should show. have been. As he should have been, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the senator from Alabama. So we've known each other for, I don't know, nine or ten years or something, something like that. But good to be with you as crypt crypto mom. Sorry, Likewise. Um, is this on or not? It is on. No, no. no. Not on. Use the handheld, please. Flip the switch. Okay. It, <laughs> I can assure you the switch was switched. <laughs> I can assure you. Um, All right, I'm going to give my disclaimer. I'm here on my own, representing my own views, not necessarily those of the commission or my fellow commissioners, so you don't have to do that anymore. But Oh, I'm here representing my own views, not the views of MIT <laughs> or, or my fellow faculty. But you know that because it's academia. Um, <laughs> Uh, what I was going to say is when I was at the CFTC, uh, and I left there in January of 14, uh, well, of course, many of you may have already been in the crypto world. Uh, by and large, each of our agencies, the Securities Exchange Commission and the CFTC, hadn't been that involved. I got involved really in the last uh, 18 months or so. Um, but Hester actually has real authority. I just teach on it. So I thought if we both, we were going to start with a few comments, and I was going to let you know, the commissioner start, and then I'll, I'll say a few words. And then we were going to try to cover quickly four topics. The primary markets, basically the initial coin offering market. Secondary markets being the exchanges. Uh, thirdly, some asset management issues. For instance, ETFs, and that's been debated. And fourthly, the derivatives market, another secondary market, but derivatives. And we're going to try to do that really quickly because we want to take about 10 minutes of questions. So that's, that's our game plan if we're successful. Um, but Crypto Mom, you want to take it off? Sure. I just want to thank everyone for the chance to be here today. It's a real honor to be at MIT. My grandfather actually went to MIT. His brains didn't make it down to me. But um, so he, tell, he told the story of he was taking a math class one day. The windows were open. It was, it was an exam. And his exam flew out the window. So his professor just walked over to him and said, purse, that's worth a B. And he's like, I'll take it. So anyway, um, so it's really great to be here. And I think it's exciting to be in a community of people who are really rethinking the way a lot of things in our world work. Um, and, so from my perspective, I don't know where that's going to go. I mean, I'm, as, I'm not, I don't have a technology mind, um, so I can't predict where that will go. But I'm, I'm enthusiastic about what changes we might see in our future because of the work that you all are doing now. So as a regulator, um, I have to think about how what you're doing interacts with the framework um, that we have in place, the regulatory framework we have in place. And that's a daunting task for me, because on the one hand, we have rules on the books that we need to, we need to enforce. Um, but on the other hand, we don't want to stop people from doing things that are going to make society a better place to live, that are going to make people's lives easier um, and enable people to interact in ways that they haven't in the past. So that's kind of the balance that I'm trying to, to that, that's the line I'm trying to walk. And I need you all to, to help me walk that line in a way that's effective um, by telling me what you're working on and, and the areas where you're worried that the rules that, that you see on our books might get in the way of that. 
Um, so that's, that's kind of the framework, the lens through which I think about all of these problems. And um, I, I, uh, I don't want to take anything away, and we're going to start this debate right now, but Hester's got some of her grandpa's brains, because I had to sometimes go up against uh, your, your logic when you were representing the senator and uh, up on the hill. Um, so uh, just give you a little nice secret nice of you to there. say, but you won a lot of those battles, I have to say. <laughs> Which is why we have such a big rule book. Yeah. Well, well, you know, we did have that little thing called the financial crisis, so, you know, 10, mil 10 million people lost hey, their this jobs. This is the solution to the financial crisis right here. These guys Woo! are thinking of it. Well, I will agree with you about that, about MIT. So uh, how I sort of think about this space in this whole area, blockchain technology and crypto finance, is that it's a new way to uh, have tamper-resistant data amongst the consensus of multiple parties. And what I'm really, my research is mostly around the business of blockchain technology. And while I get to dabble a bit on the policy side because of my former role, that's really what I'm trying to do, is to find where are the real use cases, where traditional database structures don't uh, work as well. I think finance, though, is an area that it's, it's, is applicable, because it's huge data, it's huge networking, and we're dealing with property rights, and we're moving property rights around. It's good to have a tamper-resistant way to do it, and a peer-to-peer -peer network might be, it's not always, but might be a better way to do it. Um, our financial sector still pulls about 7.5% of our economy. Um, we might be able to be a little bit more efficient than $1.5 trillion a year going to the financial sector, and I think technology might, might be able to get us there. Um, Bitcoin, by the way, actually uses an MIT license, so it's open source license on, on um, MIT. So that's what I kind of do here. But let me start, if I could, on our four quick topics the primary marketplace, uh, initial coin offerings. Um, there was a technologist, J.R. Willett, back in 2012, and he said, you know, you could build something on top of Bitcoin, and you could pre-fund, and you could, get, you could get people just to crowd fund a project. And what came to be raised off of J.R. Willett's little innovation, he, he, by the way, did not get rich on it, um, 20 to $30 billion were raised. Um, and my observation is in some jurisdictions like the US, we find ourselves thinking about things like the Howey test and what is an investment contract because this new permissionless crowdfunding uh, sure feels like uh, uh, a security. Um, how, what, what advice would you have for this audience and for the thousands of people who are in some cases feeling that they're waiting for the SEC to give more clarity in this, this world? Well, I think there is some clarity there already, right? If you're doing something that's basically saying, I'm trying to fund a project, i.e. a company, um, to build something, and I want you to give me money to do that, um, and I'm going to take the money, and I'm going to build the project with the money you give, and you're not going to have any role in that. You're just going to earn profits if I do a good job. That's a security. That looks very much like a traditional security. And so you should expect that that's going to implicate our rules. Um, and of course, if you raise money from people and you say, hey, I've got this great project, put up a white paper, get a lot of money, and then you go to um, the Caribbean with that money, leaving your, your investors uh, with nothing, then obviously we're going to come after you. That's called securities fraud. And so there's some obvious ways that, that what people do with tokens interacts with our, our regs. On the other hand, there's some areas that are much less clear. And so that's when someone says, I have a, I have a project, I wanna, we're not up and running yet, but the plan is to have this decentralized system and to have tokens operating as the currency of that system. Um, and as, you know, as the coin of the realm, essentially, of that system. And so, to, and, and, and people, Network effects matter, right? So the fact that people who, who buy those tokens will then use them in the system um, is essential. So at what point, where's the line for those? Are they securities? Are they not securities? That's the much more challenging thing. And maybe something starts out as a securities offering where you're really doing it to raise money, 
but down the line, it's not a security anymore. It's really a way for you to function in that network. And that's where I think we need to do a better job in providing people some guidance to know how does it change from one thing to another. Um, and we are, the, the staff at the SEC is working on some guidance now, but I suspect that we're still gonna wanna do some higher level, the, the commission is the one that makes the decisions, so I'd really like for the commission to come out with some guidance that would do a better job in, in drawing those lines. Now the bad news is that we do have a history of, of cases and law that grew up around this so-called Howey test, uh, and it's not, it's not clear with other kinds of assets either. It's not always clear. Sometimes it's very obvious which side of the line something falls on, but other times when you're talking about um, real estate, for example, it could actually, uh, purchasing a condo could actually be a securities transaction. So trying to figure out those lines in other contexts can also be quite difficult. Um, but I do hope that we can provide more clarity so that people are able to, to launch projects without having this cloud hanging over them. I, I find, that's helpful. I find myself agreeing with Chairman Clayton, uh, uh, Hester's uh, colleague who runs the commission, um, when he says he really hasn't seen many initial coin offerings that are not securities. I can't remember the exact words, but it was, he's said it, and he said it so many times in, in variation. Um, are you are you kind of in a sense conceptually where he is, or particularly if it's pre-functional, if it is not yet up and running? I frankly can't see how it would be anything other than an investment contract if it is yet to be functional. Well, but if you're selling tokens to someone who wants to have those tokens because the person wants to participate in that network, what why would that necessarily have to be a security? Because I think you're, uh, back to the Howey test, um, relying on the c efforts of a common enterprise, a development team that for almost all altcoins is uh, two to six developers or some computer folks working on it. Um, they may or may In not be at one company, but it's a common enterprise of others, and you're buying it at some discount. You're, you're, you're anticipating appreciation because if it's non-functional, I can't use it yet to go to the theater. I can't use it yet to get file storage. I can't use it for anything. Almost by economic uh, rationale, it will be at a discount. Well, I mean, I think this is why it's a really difficult question because sometimes these networks really do count on the activities of, of many people, right? So that's one feature. And the other, the other is there are lots of things, like I might buy a watch now uh, knowing that it's going to appreciate in value. So like hopefully you can tell the time on the watch now. <laughs> you hope, right? But you it hope. might be sitting in a drawer because really what I care about is that it's appreciating in value and I don't want to get it scratched in the meantime, right? And so I do think that we've seen lots of ICOs that are securities offerings, but I'm not willing to make the blanket statement that there's no way that you could set up a pre-functional network and sell tokens on it and not have it be a securities offering. That said, I think if you're planning to do that, you're planning to sell tokens on a pre-functional network, you better be very careful and you better get very good legal advice because it's gonna be very easy for you to, to tip into the securities right. bucket. And I guess you'd probably, maybe you'd agree with me, once it's functional, it may or may not be a security. It doesn't mean if it's functional, it is always not a security. That's where I really think we need to provide guidance because I think it, it, you know, our securities laws are actually quite broad and so is it, we may need to provide a safe harbor so that people feel comfortable having these networks up and running where the tokens are not securities. And so that's, I, I sort of have been a, a little bit more convinced of late that we need to have a safe harbor framework where people will be able to meet certain criteria and therefore know something isn't going to be treated as a security. Can, we, can I ask you about exchanges? Um, I've said publicly, um, I think that the exchanges are the gateways to get good public policy, particularly around anti-money laundering laws and, and tax compliance, but also for investor protection. That Whether it's the SEC or the agency I was once at, the CFTC, I think if Congress were to get involved, there should be some authority 
to ensure for investor protection. In essence, that there's not a manipulated market uh, front running and manipulation in the order books and the like. Um, uh, now, th that's not currently the law. I'm just saying I think that it would help, particularly if these markets got big. But in the meantime, some exchanges will need to um, register with the SEC as something called broker-dealers under regulation alternative trading system, or ATS, which kind of came along with a newer technology in the 1990s, the Internet. So the Internet led the SEC to do a new rule book for exchanges, this alternative trading system. And at the time, some people called it exchange light or broker dealer heavy, whichever way you wanted to look at it. Um, so I have a two-part question, or maybe three. Do you concur, or, or maybe you think I'm uh, off in the wrong place, that one of the two agencies should have some broad authority over, even if it's just Bitcoin, some to, to ensure that there's not front running and manipulation. That would be Congress getting involved. And two, how do you at the SEC deal with uh, those exchanges that are clearly listing tokens that are uh, investment contracts under the Howey test? Where's the third part? Well, <laughs> the third part was going to be. That was no, good. I'm going to forget one and two. So. Yeah, the third part I was going to save for you. Save, but, you know, save, it was save like, number three. Okay. Right. So, number one. No. Um, oh, shucks. I thought we were going to have a bipartisan <laughs> agreement here. Look, I mean, I think from a regulator's or former regulator's perspective, we get nervous when things aren't regulated by government. But I think one really important thing to remember is that people regulate each other in their interactions with one another. And that's sort of the whole purpose, I think, of, of the Bitcoin idea was that it would be this this community that would be able to regulate itself. And so, you know, as problems arise, people in that community are thinking about how to deal with those problems. And so I'm not sure that, I mean, one model would be to have a government regulator, but I don't think that's the only model. We'll get to question two, but I'm, I'm a little worried right now because if you stand up an exchange or if it's Coinbase or Kraken or Gemini or Poloniex, et cetera, in this country, you might have to comply with New York's bit license. You might have 50 plus states where you have money transmission rules. I, I kind of think it would be better, even from the anti-money laundering side, if not from the investor protection side, to have one regime for these exchanges okay, for money, wait, no, money to get, transmission. To get to the exchange, exchanges was part two. Part one was Bitcoin itself. Oh, no, I didn't, I, let me, Okay. part then one, I, I think it one. would be worthwhile to have some national exchange registration, either at the SEC or CFTC, even if it's just an exchange with Bitcoin on it, which is not a security, a non... Okay, so that, that's where I don't... I mean, I think if Bitcoin is not a security, then the exchanging of that doesn't need to be regulated but as... But here we've left it to 53 jurisdictions to do then. Well, I mean, again, that's... That's a question for the states, whether that's the right approach, well, but right? But federal law says they have to comply with money transmission, so it's, it's no longer a question for the states. Bank Secrecy Act says you must be either registered and regulated by I mean, that's the regulatory or, model we've chosen. Right. I'm not sure, you know, again, I think these markets could regulate themselves if we lived in a world where we allowed that. Oh, I see. Even for the money transmission side? Well, you know, again, those are, those are choices that we've made as a society. As, yeah, sure. Um, but, you know, to the extent that these exchanges or trading platforms are trading things that are securities, they fall clearly within our jurisdiction, and they do, just like other trading venues, have to comply with, you either have to register as an exchange or you've got to register as a, an alternative trading system. Um, and so some are now in the process of thinking through uh, whether they want to be alternative trading systems so that they have the freedom to trade tokens that are securities. Um, and and that's, that's a difficult process to go through, but then we'll enable them to, to be able to, to do that and then enables us to regulate for things like investor protection. So here's, you, you set up the third question, which I held for you. When, when can, I mean, some of these, and I've met with the entrepreneurs that run a number of these platforms. They just, they'd like to get registered 
with you all. As, because they feel they probably have, if they have 50 or 100 tokens on their platform, some of those tokens are securities. Um, they, they, they'd like to figure out, maybe through a, no action, uh, there's a thing called a no action letter that all these US regulatory agencies deal with, it, not, not just the SEC or CFTC. But they'd, they'd really CFTC like to get... CFTC did a lot of those under... When we did. I, I felt it was a way uh, to uh, uh, smooth out the transition. We had a, lot, a large job that Congress gave us. We did a lot of rule writing. Uh, we, uh, like the nature of any human exercise, didn't necessarily get everything right. Um, but even where we thought we got stuff right, it takes a while to transition. So we issued a lot of no action letters, uh, probably a couple hundred of them, where we said, here's six months more, here's two years more to kind of comply, or in some cases, where we trim the salesman's thing. So um, I think so it was helpful. Just so you don't think we always agree, I wrote a paper on why I thought that was illegal, what he did. <laughs> uh -huh. oh. <laughs> that said, he got a lot of rules written in a very short amount of time, so his agency worked very hard. Yeah, and bipartisan. I mean, two thirds was unanimous, and 85% uh, was at least one Republican voting with the three Democrats. Um, so, to answer your question about when, that's a fair question. We aren't as uh, fast at getting some of this stuff done. I mean, I think that on the on the exchange side, um, people need to come in and go through a process to become an alternative trading system, and that does take some time, no matter whether you're trading crypto or something else. Um, but what I would like to know is if you all know people who are in that process, going through that process and running into roadblocks, they should come talk to me. I need to know that, that they're in the process, and I want to hear how that process is going. I mean, as Chairman Gensler knows, when you're, when you're on the commission, you're not always um, privy to all the, the potential issues that are arising as the staff is considering issues. And so the staff is looking at these exchanges, these trading platforms, and they're seeing some consistent things that they feel need to be addressed. Um, and so those are things that maybe we can all address as a community instead of having them be dealt one off. Yeah. I, I mean, I could give it a list, but it kind of the top six or 10 exchanges in the, in the U.S., um, most of them have been knocking on your doors. So they should definitely knock on my door directly. All right, all right. You hear that if you're in the audience here, Circle, Coinbase, Kraken. And, so, and some of these folks have come in to talk to yeah. me, but it's, it's helpful to know through the process what's going on. Yeah. So let, let's just touch on asset management and particularly um, exchange traded funds, but there's also a bunch of issues around custody for the traditional pension funds that want to hold or asset managers want to hold. That seems like the area that's been, if I might observe, a, a bit slower at the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, and it even seems that um, you got part of your branding as Crypto Mom over a dissent you gave earlier this year, that you would have allowed the Winklevoss twins, I think it was, Gemini, to go forward with the exchange traded Fun. Do you want to say a few words about that? Sure. A number of, of folks have come in with various exchange-traded products, some of them exchange-traded funds, some other types of exchange-traded products, which are built on or somehow reference Bitcoin or Bitcoin futures or other type of crypto futures, um, Ether. Uh, so the question is, can those list and trade in the United States? They would provide another point of access for people who want to get exposure to these types of assets. Um, and you know, I think we need to look at how, what our rules allow us, what our statutory framework is, and what we're allowed to do and not do. And again, I thought that the SEC um, took a step when they said no to this particular application. I thought we went beyond our statutory authority. Um, and I thought that we should have allowed this to trade. Um, you know, you pointed out the other day, Chairman Gensler, that it's interesting that the CFTC has futures um, already trading. And, and so to, to what extent should we at the SEC look to that and say, there's a market um, and, and the CFTC is looking, can look through to the underlying for fraud and manipulation so should we rely on that? And I think that that's a very good no, point. No, I mean, uh, we had a prep call uh, to which the commissioner is referencing 
But I do think the two agencies have taken uh, different approaches, partly because of their underlying statutes are different uh, in the commodities laws. The exchanges um, can list something, list a new contract, and they don't, in a sense, don't ask for permission. And in, this, uh, in the securities law, to do a, uh, an exchange-traded fund, you kind of have to go knock on the door of the SEC and, and get permission. But underlying that, um, Bitcoin futures and I think Ethereum futures and so forth will exist, and Bitcoin ETFs have not. And that, that feels a little inconsistent to me. Uh, as an observer, and I'm now you know, in academia, right. but it, seems, it feels a little inconsistent. Even though the laws aren't exactly the same, they're quite similar. No, I mean, I think that that's a really good point. And I think, um, I mean, that's part of the reason that I, I said we should go forward is because you do have, you already have the futures markets in place, which help to discipline, again, to provide some of the discipline, which um, my colleagues at the SEC were concerned that the underlying markets had no discipline in them at all. And I think some of that we can, we can get by looking to the futures markets. Yeah. No, though the underlying markets, there's a lot of academic research on it too, still are prone and one might even say rife to manipulation uh, in some of these underlying markets. Which I think one could say of many other markets underlying securities that trade on, on exchanges. So, you know, the, the exchanges have to think about how their products, the products trading on those exchanges, will react if there's a problem in the underlying markets. Um, but as long as they have that worked out, as long as they have mechanisms in place to deal with potential challenging situations in the underlying markets, then I'm comfortable in letting them trade on our markets. Got it. And do you have any view on custody and how, whether it's, you know, there's a number of custody solutions around, but that a lot of money market funds and, and various other registrants are feeling a little bit anxious as to whether they'll comply with securities custody rules. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really one of the big issues now f at the SEC is trying to figure out the, the custody private, question. Private keys, basically. Right. Um, it, it's sort of interesting. I was reading something the other day which said, you know, it's, it's strange that that is the issue because in some ways this whole Bitcoin was supposed to be, and other crypto is supposed to be about, you've got custody yourself. And so now all of a sudden, we're trying to layer on or see how that interacts with our regime, which doesn't really, uh, that's not really how most things in our regime work. So I think this is gonna be a challenging area. Um, it may be an area where we need to adjust our rules, but um, in the meantime, you know, I think a lot of smart people are trying to think through different potential workable custody solutions. And, and while a few people come up to the mics, because we're going to take try to take 10 quick minutes of questions, you, you, want, you said you wanted to ask me something about crypto derivatives. Oh, well, I mean, I think I'd love to just hear your perspective from someone who's been at the agency and sort of how you would have thought that through had you been at the agency um, at, at the time when this issue had come really come into the agency's purview. So I, I think that um, it's a tough challenge. The question is whether if an underlying market is susceptible to manipulation, what do you do if an exchange that's well-regulated, in, in this case it was the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and Chicago Board, which is called SIBO, and I think there's some others, maybe Ledger X as well, uh, came in. Um, uh, so well-regulated exchange, but the underlying market is kind of rough and tumble. <laughs> And, and what to do. Now, because the law is over at the Commodity Exchange Act uh, law is a little different, it's self-certification, uh, though I wasn't in the foxhole as uh, Chris Giancarlo was, I might have come out similarly. I mean, they, they ended up with 47 to 54% collateral, I mean, um, margin, so very high margin. So I, I, I don't know, it might be that you you'd sort of, you ask a lot of good questions, um, but they'd still go live. And have you been surprised at, at the pace at which, I mean, the volume's not tremendously high. Have you been surprised about that, or is that sort of what you would have anticipated? Um, there, I think because there's not a lot of institutional money here yet. I mean, the, the, the deep pools of money, uh, the worldwide capital markets are $300 trillion plus, 
and the big pension funds and so forth largely aren't there. It's a lot of uh, family offices, uh, crypto hedge funds, maybe some crypto billionaires now, now crypto millionaires, but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, crypto, winter, crypto winter is not a bad thing because it, it focuses the mind very well. So. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and look, what, look what often happens after the winter, spring comes. So it's all right, it's all right. Um, um, I think the other interesting thing in the derivative space, and then we'll take questions, is, um, and it relates a little bit to uh, decentralized and uh, platforms and atomic swaps and so forth, is you can have algorithms that are effectively swaps. You can have algorithms that you program a smart contract, and in Europe they call them contract for differences. Here we call it futures or swaps, but it's basically a financial commitment that is settled in another currency. It could be settled in Bitcoin or settled in euros or dollars. And I think that's a very interesting place. And we heard a presentation in the other auditorium from Abra, who's doing something, who says, uh, and, and the CEO from Abra said, I just wish the Securities and Exchange Commission could finish on their securities-based swap uh, rules and so forth. So uh, it's not, I'm just, I'm just carrying out his, his message. You said you wanted you know, to hear. You know what everyone tells me is, if you could just copy what Gary Gensler did, because we're already doing it. It was so painful at the time that we had to do it, but now we're already doing it, so could you and, please and, do and, the same and, thing? And, and, and I know that you might say, oh my God, but they're saying it kind of works. We're making it work and so forth. Just, you know, and it was bipartisan. <laughs> I've never heard them say that, but. <laughs> you, you never heard them say that? Just a little bit on the edge. A $400 trillion pain point that helped, it wasn't the only reason, but helped lead to 10 million people losing their You guys their better jobs. start asking questions, otherwise we're gonna be yeah. talking about Title VII of Dodd-Frank, yeah, and that yeah, is yeah. not what you We want. actually get along pretty well. We just have a little bit different <laughs> policy view. I mean, but this is what democracy is about. This is really it what is. it is. And that's why I think both of us probably love the commission structure, because it brings people with very different views um, together to discuss these things and to kind of wrestle them out together, and that leads to greater policy consistency yeah. over time, which I think is I, I said to Chairman Shelby, in a, in a, when I was leaving in January 14, I went around to see the, the chairman, her, uh, Hester's former boss, and we had a lovely little visit in his office, and I said, uh, Senator, you never asked me, in all those times I testified, you never asked me whether the commission structure was a good structure. Uh, and I would have gone on the record and said, yes, I think that the American system benefits with five people, sometimes duking it out, sometimes kind of publicly trying to, you know, narrow the other person's options. And I certainly had that from very clever commissioners who would, but I think it was better. I think we ended up, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, more um, uh, thoughtful uh, products at the end. So it's fun. Thank you very much. Um, so I think one of the biggest philosophical issues that many of us in crypto have with these types of regulations is around our sort of chafing at the prohibition of retail participation. Um, and it may be hubristic, but many of us are not independently wealthy, and we still believe that we can make good investment decisions. And right now, we're kind of excluded from participating. And so my question is, how can we move the accredited investor laws away from wealth thresholds and towards something that's frankly like far more reasonable and accessible to mainstream investors? So, I mean, I love that question and I wish that there were um, a lot more people like those of you in the room who were clapping because I think that, so our accredited investor rules effectively say that you have to have certain wealth level or certain income level in order to participate in cert certain types of investment products. Um, I personally think that those rules are not consistent with what this country is about, which is about people taking opportunities, taking their talents and their intelligence and applying it to make their lives better. And we've put this artificial barrier in place so people can't do that. Um, that said, so I think what I would, if I were running the show, what I would do is I would have, you can opt into the securities framework if you want to opt in, otherwise you can be outside of it, and that means you better make your own good decisions, because when you make a mistake and you lose all your money, don't come crying to me. 
Um, however, I have not yet convinced my colleagues that that's the appropriate way to go. So I think that um, sort of to, to what you raised in your question, I think it's more likely that we'll think about ways that we can open up the accredited investor definition so that there are other ways to show that, you're, that you are able to handle investing in this area. Again, I chafe at that myself because I think it's, you know, you, are, you worked hard to earn the money, you're investing it. Um, if you want to invest it in a stupid project, that's your choice. But <laughs> in any event, I think that there is an appetite for opening up the accredited investor definition to making it um, cover more types of sophistication. So again, if you all have thoughts about what that would look like, let me know what you think the right criteria are. First of all, I want to say it's, uh, it's really refreshing to see a, a true visionary at the SEC, so I'm, I'm really a big fan of what your, what your work is. My question is probably a follow-on to, to his, is around secondary markets. So now we have this 12-month lockup for accredited investors. Um, is there any conversations or, or, or will at the SEC to, to do something a little bit less with the, the, the post lockup now that we have potentially easier secondary markets uh, in play? You put me on the spot by saying I was a visionary, and then if I come back and say no. Um, I mean. A thoughtful visionary. <laughs> you know, again, I would love to make it easier for people to do what they want to do. I don't, you know, I think there have been thoughts about liberalizing secondary markets more generally, not just in this space, and about making it easier for people to, to trade um, who otherwise would be restricted from doing so, but I think movement on that is gonna be difficult to push forward. But again, if you have ideas about how that might work or what that might look like, let me know. Uh, thanks for coming today. Um, so uh, talking about derivatives on a whole, right? So if you look at traditional assets, um, was it uh, Bank of International S uh, Standards say that uh, um, the ratio of derivatives to underlying assets is some 40x number? Um, so if you take Bitcoin at like 70 billion market, you could potentially have what, like $3 trillion of derivatives on top of this asset. So what... Um, you know, barring any uh, technological changes within custody and the institutional support for that, what would an ETF do for really mature capital markets today in terms of acting as that collateral for derivatives? Um, I should give this question to Gary because I don't have a great so, I don't have a great answer to uh, it. I think I. I if I understand your question, it's kind of two parts. Why do you need ETFs if you also have derivatives? And I think on that part of the question, I think just like in any other market, the gold, the oil, or the stock markets, we have both the S&P 500 uh, ETF, right. and a lot of people are long only and wish to invest, maybe some people in the room, and some people do S&P futures to both go long and short on a levered, uh, basis, which by the way, every single day you have to meet margin, and if you can't meet margin calls on a daily basis, you're closed out. Mm -hmm. So there's the two products live side by side, and I think, uh, though they're regulated by different agencies, um, uh, I think the capital markets benefit from a fully collateralized long ETF right. with. If the second part of your question is, um, is a little bit, it seems like you have another part of your question about um, uh, the custody in ETF. Well, see, meaning like it, right now there's um, cash settlement, right? Yeah. So it, um, in the absence of doing physical settlement with a Bitcoin mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to a, an investor who may not have a wallet, right, utilizing the ETF as that settlement. Um, you... you <laughs> If there were ETFs that were approved and authorized and everything, you could use it for settlement. I still think, looking at other markets, whether it's commodities-based ETFs or stock-based ETFs, settlement is almost uniformly in fiat currency. Gotcha. And I think, I think you'd, you'd see that it would be more efficient 
to settle either in crypto or fiat. Right. I think, but that's a hunch as to but from these other markets. But, I mean, I think you point out something more generally, which is it's good to have different avenues to entry into these markets and to exposure to these markets, which is sort of the point I've been harping on. You know, what, one avenue might work better for someone who doesn't have a wallet, for example, or doesn't want to go through the trouble of and the risk of, of interacting with the markets that way um, and might prefer to do it in the more regulated ETF market. So I like options for people. So in case the clock runs out, can we just collect it? it, it oh, s s do it really quick. <laughs> sure. I'm Jason Rockwood. I'm the country manager for VeChain. Um, we uh, deal a lot with enterprise clients. And one of the things that um, we see over and over is that enterprises are reluctant to get involved with blockchain and crypto because um, they're not sure how to properly classify the asset or to um, manage some of the regulatory confusion around it. And my question for you guys is, do you think that um, is, is the work of the SEC um, g going to impact that at all? Or do you think that that's other departments that handle that? Um, and or do you see enterprise clarity uh, coming so that we can open the door more widely to their participation in this ecosystem as well? I think there's real interest from a lot of institutional players now in the in the market. So that means that um, we are being pushed to, you know, make some decisions. And I think that's going to be helpful. If we make decisions that provide more clarity, it's going to be helpful to people all across the spectrum deciding to participate in this space. Um, but you know, that does require us to make some decisions. Yeah, but I think, though, there's some regulatory piece of this. I think that a lot of institutions, as you call them, enterprise, are really waiting for good custody solutions, good exchanges that they trust, the infrastructure. I think when the infrastructure gets better, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, some of these issues matter, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put too much focus on the SEC or even the CFTC and say, I think, you know, solve the custody and solve the infrastructure and do the layer two. Everybody's been talking about lightning networks and things like that. As those things get solved, then there will be more. Yeah, adoption. I mean, I think that's I really a, think so. Yeah, that's a great point because I think um, even what we're hearing is that people who are working on those solutions are hearing lots of interest from established players who are really eager for them to get those solutions going so that they can then participate in the markets. Yeah, and so it could be, it could be products that like Fidelity is doing in custody or ICE is doing with this backed product, or I'm using local companies too, but Circle with the US dollar coin and so forth, or all the companies that you're hearing today. Some will fail, oh, sorry about that, but <laughs> others, others will succeed. I don't think it's just a regulatory clarity thing, e even though that will help, I'm just saying. So for those of you who didn't get to ask questions, know that my door is always open. If you're ever in DC, stop by, um, or you can always give me a call or shoot me an email. So how many people like this little back and forth here? And, uh, uh,